Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now where we last left off, Jinger in a bid to rescue Kenta confronted Kiyoya's gang, the face hunters at the construction site. Lured into an ambush, they quickly realised their error, as Jinger effortlessly tears through the Honda Blader challenge en route of the anticipated bout with Kiyoya. This is my review of the Metal Fight manga chapter 2, Leon's Raw. Now chapter 2 picks up right where we left off, rather than an arbitrary length of time passing between the events of each chapter, like how it was handled in the anime. Jinger finishes off the face hunters which only cements Kiyoya's interest in claiming Pegasus for himself. Now, Kiyoya isn't really willing to simply hand Kenta over quietly, and after pulling this lever, the construction beam he was standing on disconnects, falling to the ground and almost crushing Jinga in the process, as Kiyoya escapes with Kenta to the roof of the structure, forcing Jinga to pursue them. This exchange leads to one of the most several funny moments of this chapter, Jinga realising that the only way he's ever going to reach the roof is by climbing the supporting frame of the structure, frustrated that Kiyoya didn't prepare an easier way of reaching the top beforehand. This chapter was definitely more on the light-hearted side for the most part given the stakes involved, Involved, which is something I do appreciate. As I mentioned in the last review, I wanted to see more character interaction going forward, something Chapter 2 does succeed in. When he finally reaches the roof, however, he's greeted to the site of Kiyoya's personal base stadium that provides us with this really cool visual of the trio standing beside the stadium. In the background, you can see the other buildings of the town in the distance, as well as the ground below adding a nice bit of visual depth to the scene. Kenta is the one to essentially raise the stakes here, observing that if Jinga loses his footing at any point on the narrow platform, he's pretty much a goner. And again, I prefer the gritty approach the manga is taking here. In the anime, Kenta's Sagittario was the source of tension for this particular battle, and in the context of this world and how they view Beyblading in general, I guess it works well enough. Although you can certainly see how they try to lighten this scene for a younger demographic. The manga doesn't shy away from the darker elements which elevates the story and leaves me a lot more engaged than it otherwise would have. Kiyoya challenges Jinga to a battle with Pegasus on the line if he so happens to lose, and Kenta obviously objects to this as he doesn't want to risk the chance of Jinga losing his babe because he was captured by the face hunters. However, Jinga reassures him, accepting the challenge. Now, in the anime adaptation, there was a B plot involved with this entire battle, where Pegasus was at risk of being unable to use its full power as Madoka had yet to finalise the repair she was making beforehand. In the manga, Jinga does kind of hint towards that himself vaguely, acknowledging that Pegasus had been involved in a ton of difficult battles as of late, evident by the amount of scars covering the metal wheel, although it doesn't really come into play at all, but it's interesting to note nonetheless. Both Kiyoya and Jinga step up to the stadium ready to begin their battle, and just as they both reach one on the countdown, Jinga all of a sudden comes down with a cool sneezing, the jolt causing Pegasus to fall from the launcher and drop into the ground, with Jinga asking if they could battle on ground level instead as it was freezing up on the roof. This exchange has to be my favourite moment of this chapter by far, it's just so random to the point that I wasn't expecting it. The manga continues to portray Jinga in a lighter manner, yeah he still has that edge about him, however for the most part he's just a goofball, this just adds more dimensions to him as a a character. Now where I personally found this funny, Kiyoya certainly does not, becoming enraged as he takes this as a sign of disrespect, vowing to kill him launching Leon 155 defence into the stadium. Jinga finally gets his act together and the battle commences. Now initially you have both Leon and Pegasus circling around the edge of the stadium, at high speeds amazing Kenta in the process, as he's never really seen anything like this before meeting Jinga. Once both bears had sized each other up however, Leon being a defensive type settles within the centre, whilst Pegasus continues to circle around Leon building up its speed through the flat performance tip. In the previous review, I didn't really go into too much depth when it came to the battles of the first chapter. That's simply because they weren't all that interesting and at times became hard to follow. There wasn't necessarily a storyline or a flaw for me to really discuss, as the main themes of the first chapter's battles was to establish the main cast of characters, as well as teaching Kenta to believe in himself as a blader and Sagittario. Chapter 2 not only builds upon the framework of the previous chapter, it refines it entirely. The movements of the blades are easier to follow, along with a clear attempt to storytelling and a level of flow that is present here, and this becomes apparent as early as their first attack. Wasting no time, Pegasus raises to the centre to meet Leon head on, Leon effortlessly knocking Pegasus away to the shock of both Jinga and Kenta. Jinga launches yet another attack only for Pegasus to be repelled airborne by an invisible force. Fortunately, Pegasus is able to survive the ordeal unscathed, circling around the edge of the stadium once more, as Jinga is left bewildered to what is truly going on. Kenta is the first to realise that the invisible force was in fact the wind, and this is when we discover the stadium was specifically designed to protect Leon through the strong air currents. Due to the high altitude, the base aid is surrounded by harsh winds, with only equilibrium existing in the centre where Leon naturally resides as a defence type, providing Kiyoya with an unfair advantage through the use of Leon's gale force wall. 
This revelation places Jinga in a precarious predicament. Pegasus is forcefully dragged back into the center due to the intense wind. No matter what Jinga tries, it seems there is only one possible outcome. If he attacks Leon directly, Pegasus could be repelled resulting in the stadium out. However, if he refuses to act, Pegasus will be sucked back into the eye of the storm. The wind wearing down its stamina until it inevitably stops spinning. Unsure of what to do, the storm suddenly intensifies, knocking Jinga off the roof, seemingly to his death. Fortunately, he was able to grab a hold of the supporting frame, pulling himself back up to safety. Jinga then realises his scarf was missing, averting his gaze skyward to the sight of the cloth floating tranquilly above the storm, discovering the one weakness to Leon's defence in the process. Sending Pegasus into one final collision with Leon, the force of the Gale Force wall repels Pegasus upward far beyond the clouds. Kiyoya, thinking he's won at this point, begins to taunt Jinga over his foolish decision, and Kenta believes this as well, apologising relentlessly as he believes that Jinga has just lost his Pegasus because he was trying to save him. That was until the twinkle in the sky rains down from above, revealing Pegasus to the amazement of both Kiyoya and Kenta. The former fits the clues together, however by then it was too late. Unable to do anything as Pegasus hits Leon from above with a Star Blast attack, or the shooting Star Attack as it's known here, winning Jinga the battle. Kenta naturally celebrates only to find Jinga relieving himself in plain sight on top of the construction site. I'm not even kidding, his first instinct after beating Kiyoya is to take a piss. I love this Jinga so much. We are treated to this nice little moment between Kiyoya and Jinga, as he returns Leon to him, earning Kiyoya's respect in the process the pair share in a handshake. I think I prefer this take on Kiyoya already. I love Kiyoya in general to be honest, although in the anime the approach they went with was that of the stereotypical rival character. He was portrayed to be rather stubborn and close-minded in the sense that he wasn't really willing to accept his defeat so easily. To put it bluntly, he's essentially the Vegeta to Jinga's Goku. Whilst ultimately there will be far greater antagonists that will crop up to challenge Jinga, such as Ryuga, you could certainly acknowledge Kyoya as Jinga's greatest rival, on the virtue of his persistent ambition of defeating him. Whilst in the manga so far, he's more open to becoming an ally, growing to respect Jinga immediately after his defeat. This brief moment is cut short by the interruption of a helicopter. A man stood upon the landing gear, laughing at the three, later to be introduced as Doji. Yeah, Doji appears already, but when I say that, I'm also referring to him revealing himself to Jinga directly. He also appears at the end of the second episode as well, however he only makes himself known to Kiyoya, planning to use him to defeat Jinga indirectly. By what he says here, he seems to have been pursuing Jinga directly for quite some time, rather than observing him from a distance. Also inside the helicopter, we see the silhouette of a young child, although we don't get to see their face for some reason. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I believe this could be the manga version of you, but I'm not entirely sure. Regardless, they don't play a role in the conclusion of this chapter. Now before Jinga could even react, Doji reveals his pre hybrid wheel wolf, launching it with the intent of straight up killing Jinga. He tries to warn the others, but it's too late as Wolf cleanly cuts through the steel of the supporting frames, causing the building to collapse underneath them. Already, Doji is certainly more sinister and a larger threat in the manga than the cactus lover we are accustomed to in the anime. Fleeing from the scene, the trio are sent hurtling to their deaths, Kiyoya mourning the destruction of his castle. Leon's roar ends on a cliffhanger, the face of Jinga, Kenta and Kiyoya unknown among the wreckage. Now as always, we'll cover the alterations made when adapting this chapter to the anime adaptation, starting from the minor changes to the more significant differences between the two versions. The first change I want to bring up is the clear time gap present in the anime version. Whilst chapter 2 picks up immediately where the previous left off, in the anime there's a clear time gap between the events of the first episode and Jinga's first battle with Kiyoya. At the beginning of the episode, Jinga is seen battling with Osama, Takashi and Akira at the Bay Park, implying that Jinga has now been in time for at least a little bit of time. Kiyoya is seen trying with the rest of the face hunters in the warehouses by the port. This alteration honestly makes no sense to me personally, it just feels awkward and disjointed to put it bluntly. Just think about this for a minute, are you really trying to tell me that Kyoya willingly let Jinga and Kenta walk away after the 100 blade of battle, only to go through the lengths he does in stealing Sagittario in order to lure Jinga to yet another battle? Surely you see the problem with this. It's just so convoluted and a needless change on their part, painting the face hunters in a foolish light. Why would you go through all of this trouble in the first place when you could have faced Jinga at the construction site? This at the very least leads into the next minor change when it involves a reason for their battle. Since Kenta was never kidnapped in this version, Jinga's confrontation with Kiyoya is instead centered around saving Kenta's Sagittario that was stolen by Benke earlier in the episode. Saving Sagittario becomes the focal point that drives Jinga on to face Kiyoya, rather than Kenta's well-being. As I mentioned earlier, when you 
take into account how Beyblading is viewed in this world, this change does work. Although it just doesn't feel as intense or as impactful than the safety of another human being. I understand that they had to make the anime more suitable for a younger audience, but I just prefer how the manga handled this one. The last of the minor changes stems from the location of their battle. Rather than the stadium being on the roof of the construction site, we are introduced to a location we never see again after this episode, Bay Tower. Apart from the change in aesthetic, nothing of note has really been altered here. The Bay Tower Stadium shares the same properties to that of the construction site, suited for Leon's defence and Gale Force Wall. The battle also follows along the same general story beats as well. The only thing that is outright missing here is Jigga's near death fall, his scar simply coming loose by the harsh winds in this version. Now I think it's time to discuss the elephant in the room, or should I say the mechanic? Probably the most major change between the two versions would be the clear absence of Madoka in the manga. Madoka makes her anime debut on this episode and she plays a major role in the B plot of the episode. After encountering Jinga at his usual spot beside the bridge, she scolds him over his treatment of Pegasus, taking it in for repairs. Because of the face hunter's actions, however, Jinga had to take Pegasus before its maintenance was complete, resulting in the degradation of its balance leading up to the battle with Rock Leon. On the other hand, she fails to appear at all in the original manga. Now, I have no idea if she'll be introduced in a future chapter or if she's an anime exclusive character. Although it's interesting to experience this chapter after watching the anime so many times, due to how integral she is as a character throughout the Metal Fight series. I hope she does appear later on though, as she's a great character in my opinion. The last of the changes involves Doji's actions thus far. Whilst he does make an appearance in both versions, his motive is presented in a clearer manner in the manga, interrupting the three with the intention of killing Jinga. I presume to stop him from challenging Ryuga in a later chapter, though I could be entirely wrong on that front. Either way, Doji has a clear focus in this version compared to his anime counterpart. In the anime, he preferred to work from the shadows initially as he waited on Ryuga's recovery, using the face hunters as a means of getting to Jinga indirectly until the time was right. If I had to compare the two, I prefer his appearance in the manga so far, simply because he feels more like a genuine threat than the bland villain the anime portrays him as. Overall, Leon's raw expands upon everything that works in the previous chapter, whilst fine-tuning its weaker aspects such as the pacing and the character interactions to truly craft a special chapter. I really enjoyed the story Takafumi Adachi is trying to tell here, blending the serious undertones with the light-hearted moments seamlessly. The battle between Kiyoya and Jinga didn't disappoint either, and was by far a lot easier to follow than those found within the previous chapter. I'm intrigued to see where the story goes in the next few chapters, with Doji's motivation still veiled in mystery, and I also hope we find out the identity of the other kids soon enough. But anyway, that's all from me. If you love Beyblade content and want to see more videos like this on the channel, don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button. I release videos on a weekly basis ranging from Metal Fight to Bakuten Shoe and maybe some boost content in the near future. Your support helps the channel grow and I thank all of you for sticking around. As always, take care and I'll catch you in the next one.